welcome back to A Beginner's Guide to Neural Mechanisms. In part three, I'm going to walk you through another example in the philosophy of neuroscience. So where we left off last time, we were talking about neuroimaging and psychology. So Max Coldhart and others critique neuroimaging. They claim that it can't tell us anything about the mind. Whereas I and other optimists think that it can because there are reliable structure function mappings in the brain. But the question remains, what and how much can it tell us? So I want to talk a little bit about what I think it can and can't tell us. So if we accept structure, structure function mappings, can neuroimaging tell us about representations in the brain? And there is evidence that it can do that. So with recent techniques uh, like multivariate pattern analysis, We've seen that the brain actually, the voxels in neuroimaging data, show that there are different patterns in the brain uh, that correspond to different categories of objects. So for instance, if you look at a face, your brain is going to show one pattern at, of activity. If you look at a house, other areas of the brain will be activated in a different pattern. Chairs are the same thing, shoes the same thing. So each of these classes of objects has a distinguishable pattern of activity in the brain, a kind of fingerprint. And if you do uh, pattern recognition using classifiers or machine learning, you can decode from brain activity to figure out what object is likely being viewed. But the, can this actually tell us something about representations in the brain? So what are representations? Philosophers have struggled with this problem. And if you want to get representations that actually have uh, causal import, they're going to have to be some sort of physical structure with causal properties. So that would be what phil philosophers call the vehicles of the content. And those vehicles have to stand in for something else, namely the content itself. So there's a distinction between vehicle and content where the content is the semantics of the representation. Then there's going to be a parallel between the formal, or in this case, the physical properties of these representations and their semantics that make possible intelligent behavior. So how is it that brain activity can lead to intelligent behavior? It's that different kinds of brain activity stand for different things in the world, and manipulation of those physical structures leads to changes in the semantic structure. So other desiderata for representations have been uh, identified. So first of all, in order to identify a rep representation, it should have a certain function. So representations should be part of a system of representation that has a function for the organism. Representations then have to be used or consumed or interpreted by the system in such a way that they have an impact on the behavior of the system. They must play some role in explaining intelligent behavior. And then naturalistic philosophers obviously want the content to be naturalizable. And having a handle on misrepresentation is another reason to think that you do have a handle on representation. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about a novel neuroscientific technique called representational similarity analysis, or RSA. So RSA is a model-based technique of analysis for fMRI data. And it's essentially a method for calculating the similarity between different kinds of representational geometries. That is, in a system of representation, there's going to be some kind of structure that governs that system. And what you're looking for are relationships between different kinds of representational geometries. So rather than the standard way in which people use decoding methods for understanding the semantics of neural activity, RSA compares the pattern of activity to that of some kind of structured model that's either empirically or theoretically derived. So if you look at the right side of the screen, you'll see, for instance, two different stimuli that somebody might look at, one a hand and one an umbrella. Looking at that is going to create a pattern of brain activity distinct for each of those stimuli. So you see, just to the right of that, two different patterns of brain activity. You're seeing uh, 3D uh, representations of voxel activity levels. 
And what you can do is then compute the dissimilarity between those patterns and populate a similarity matrix where things that are closely related uh, are colored in one color and things that are more distantly related are colored in another color. Um, and by looking at relationships between the dissimilarity matrices, matrices that are produced from fMRI and different kinds of models, either based on, for instance, dissimilarity judgments and behavior, um, the stimulus description, for instance, a pixel-based uh, encoding of the objects when you look at it on a screen, or various computational models that you might have for how different uh, object identities are encoded, you can make hypotheses about the kinds of representations that are housed in that part of the brain. One of the beauties of RSA is it allows cross-format structural comparisons. That is, you can compare, for instance, your brain activity to your computational model. You can compare it to uh, the results from other brain areas. You can compare it to results from neuroimaging studies of other animals. You can compare it to results from other kinds of methods of cell recording. And by this, try to extract the structure of what you're looking at, the structure of the representations uh, from your data. And this structural similarity provides a key to the function. So what you're looking at here is data from two different areas in the human brain, human inferotemporal cortex on the left and human early visual cortex on the right. Early visual cortex is basically sensitive to the visual properties of the stimulus. And if you give people lots of different stimuli, because they're different shapes, different colors, placed in different parts of the visual uh, field, et cetera, you're not gonna get a lot of similarity across these different objects. And what you see in the right-hand panel is a hodgepodge of activity patterns. But if you look at human IT, infrotemporal cortex, that's a part of the brain that we think is involved in object recognition. And what you can see is that the similarity, in particular among faces, is extremely high. And the similarity between human faces and animal faces is also pretty high. And those are the big blue squares that you see, or the smaller blue squares within the bigger blue square. Um, this bigger blue square corresponds to animate stimuli. Um, and then when you look at the red squares, those are inanimate stimuli. So you see that the brain at that part, of, in, in that part of the brain, what's being represented distinguishes between the animate and the inanimate, and among animate between faces and other uh, animate body parts. Um, and so there's much more similarity among those things uh, than among some you know, random collection of objects. And you can make inferences then about what that part of the brain is doing by the similarity in the patterns. So while I think RSA gives us reason to think we have some access to neural representations, I don't think it gives us direct access to neural representations, primarily because as I noted before, philosophers have made a distinction between the vehicle and the content. And if you look at fMRI, you must realize that the data that we have is in terms of voxels, that is, uh, volumetric pixels in the brain, which are imposed upon the brain by the experimental technique. Every voxel in fMRI measures something on the order of a cubic um, three by three cubic millimeters of brain tissue and averages the activity across that brain tissue. Um, but these are really only abstractions from the true neural vehicles. The true neural vehicles are going to be the neurons in that tissue or collections of neurons, and they don't necessarily reside in those voxels in a, in a straightforward way. So the fMRI vehicles that we're looking at are only abstractions from the true neural vehicles carrying the neural representations. And moreover, they don't have causal powers. It's not that a voxel in fMRI 
causes something else, but rather it's the neurons within the voxels that have the causal powers. So therefore, I think fMRI gives us only proxy vehicles. Our notion of content is really provisional at well, as well, because it comes from an isomorphism with the content of our models. So the content that we can ascribe is really only as good as our model content. In addition, understanding content will involve paying attention to the kinds of redux me mechanisms or probes uh, that we can devise. And unless we know that information is consumed by the downstream pro processes, it could very well be epiphenomenal to behavior and not really part of the representation driving intelligent behavior at all. So those are reasons to be cautious about inferring content from RSA. But it does suggest that we can infer representational contents from po proxy vehicles or approximate representational contents from proxy vehicles. So to conclude, I call the kinds of representational structure indicated by the analysis of fMRI activation patterns provisional representations. These fMRI investigations of representation give us a how possibly, but not necessarily a how actually story. That is, we have some story of how content might be represented that accords with our empirical results. But even though this is not definitive, the work presents us with clear hypotheses to test with other techniques. So there are a number of further questions that this kind of work engenders. What evidence do we have for representation consumers? That is, do we have any way of getting at the downstream processes that read out the information that we're looking at with fMRI? Should we be adopting the classical view of representation when thinking about neural representation? That is, should we be making things like vehicle content distinctions? They've worked very well when we think about computation in non-natural terms, but is that what the brain is doing? What fixes the content of these representations? Why is it that the content is for instance, a face rather than the uh, outside representation of the face, for instance, or any other thing that overlaps with what we're looking at. And what attitude should we take to the reality of neural representation? Are there marks of the real or, or, or objective, or are we essentially seeing what we want to see in the data? That's the end of part three.